Let's stand before the Lord. And if you don't mind, if you're near somebody that looks like a father, just say, be blessed. Just tell them, be blessed. Be blessed, fathers. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed in Jesus. How many of you are glad to know it is by the blood of Jesus Christ life flows into this place today? Amen. <laughs> and wow. So, um, Ultimately, on Father's Day, we got to give great praise to the Father who art in heaven. And it's because the Father who art in heaven that, that we get to reside, we get to go on, we get to live, we get to be blessed in it and with it and through it. Danny, I praise God for your healing, brother. Praise God that he's keeping you here. Amen. I praise God for that. Praise God for that. And so uh, I just want to thank you all for being the church you are. Uh, hopefully at the end of, of the 11 o'clock service, we will have seen 10,000 people walk through the baptismal waters in Bowling Green, Kentucky. That's awesome. But guess what? I think we're going to see 10,000 more. Now, we're going to have to do that quicker. If some of us are going to see that, we're going to have to do that quicker. Y'all feeling me? David, you feeling me? We got to do this one quicker. But the good news is I've read the Bible and I've seen 3,000 happen in one day. So I, I don't want us to limit what God really could do. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity, the ability to be a father. I personally thank you for the children that you have uh, given to Elizabeth and I. And I thank you for all the other fathers in this room today. And as we celebrate what it means to father, Lord, I pray that you will just, uh, first of all, motivate the fathers in here, reassure the fathers in here, bless them in here, Lord, because all of us father in some way, in some way. And so, Lord, uh, I thank you for so many children at Hillview Heights Church. I thank you for what they're becoming. I thank you right now, Lord, and we lift up right now Children's Camp as 25 children that are a part of that camp uh, we know haven't received you yet, and we pray that they all 25 of them come back. Lord, we pray for over 100 kids from Hillview that are there, that, that they would just be encouraged. Lord, I pray right now for those uh, seeking to have children that, that your blessing will be upon them and you grant that, and folks would receive that, Lord. And, Lord, that you bring fathers into our lives in many ways. It's in the name of Jesus we ask your blessing. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Fathers, happy Father's Day. And I want to give you just some quick heads up. One of the things I do on Father's Day is I try to be shorter because men like it shorter. You know, get on with it. Tell me what I need to be told. Let me hear the truth and let me walk on with it. Let me live it out. How many of y'all are glad to be a father? Let's start there. Anybody happy about being a father? That's good. That's good. You ought to like it. Does everybody know how you become a father? Okay, this is a great confusion in our nation today. We have people, we have politicians, and you would think single motherhood's like a cold. You catch it. No, you don't catch it. Single motherhood exists because of the absence of obedient fathers. Now, you want to see a nation changed you gotta, you got to step into the role. So I'm going to ask all the men to man up to what God's made you to be. Now, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you already there. Now be what you've been made. Be what you've been made. If God made you a father, then you need to live out that assignment because a living out that assignment is the most blessed life you can live. I love being a father. In fact, today, today... Exactly today, on this day, I became a father 29 years ago. And I, I had no business being a father. But Elizabeth and I, after almost five years of marriage, <laughs> we, we weren't sure we were going to have children because we were in the ministry. God used, used me to reconstruct churches. I was always around a lot of mean religious people. And I'm not sure I wanted to see other human beings exposed to that. But finally, the Lord convinced us that, that we need to have children. And, and what was scary, not only was I going to have children, I was going to have pastor's kids. And those were some of the craziest people I'd ever met in my life had grown up in pastor's homes. And so God eased our fears 
And here's the way he eased them. He said, I'm not calling you to something I haven't already prepared you to be. Fathers aren't made. Fathers are given ability by God. Because guess what we do? We don't. I've heard people say this. Pastor Wayne, I've heard this before. The job of the father and responsibility is to reflect the character of God. That ain't our job. That's weak. We ain't reflectors. We are projectors. That's a huge difference. See, I don't reflect what God might be. I project who God is. So the first thing, fathers, our first assignment, we're to be blessers. If you go back to the first te testament, we meet old father Abraham there. What's father Abraham doing? He's blessing the children. He's blessing what God's given him. So fathers, I want to tell you, I hope you'll be a champion of the blessing. You'll be a champion of the blessing. How many of y'all glad to know that your children ought to look at you and say, hey, here comes one of God's blessings, my daddy. I can say that about my earthly father. I've been very privileged in, in, in fatherhood business. Uh, my, my father who art in heaven saved me, redeemed me, and put me in motion. My father on earth made sure I understood my father who art in heaven. My dad's still alive. He was here this morning. I told him, happy Father's Day. And my dad was given a crazy assignment. My dad was off the hook. They couldn't have children. I looked at my dad. You could have been rich. <laughs> but you got four kids. And not only did God assign them one time, he signed them three other times. I am an adopted child. Guess what that means? That means I'm a child of choice. Right. I'm a child of choice. And I think to myself, oh, my goodness, I am so blessed by a biological mother that was so smart that she realized a teenager didn't need any of this. I gave a brilliant attorney a run for his money with Jesus Christ. <laughs> so she did the most loving thing she could do. She said, I love this child that's in my womb so much. I'm going to position this child to become what God made it to be. And the first thing is, you got to have a daddy. How many of y'all realize daddies are important? They're important because they're the sign of blessing. And the number one job of the father is to bless the house. That's what we do. We bless the house. So guess what? Wives, when your husband goes to work, it's because he's going to bless the house. When he comes back in, it's because he's working at blessing the house. Chuck, you've been all day long. You worked hard, didn't you, to do what? Bless the house and to make sure Ann could go to TJ Maxx and have something to spend. <laughs> you didn't want her to go over there without any blessing or money. So we provide. It's okay. How many of you, how many of you fathers enjoy providing? Yeah. We do. We enjoy providing. We enjoy providing. And that is our biblical position is to provide. Now, we've messed up all these roles in our society, but if we would go back to their identity, things would straighten up. Dream with me for just a moment. How much would change in the United States of America, all these problems we hear all these people talking about, if every father fathered their child? Uh-oh. How many of you educators would love to teach a group of students who had fathers. How many of you all would love to teach a group of students that their fathers would bless them? See, my father always blessed me. Now, when I was out of line, he blessed me back in line. See, we've lost that art. I'm going to show you why. Fathers, your job, number one job, because God has given you these children, here's what you should desire. Here's what you should desire. This is what I desire. I still desire it today. Even though I am out of the primary fathering role, okay, your role as father changes. I'm out of the primary fathering role. My children are adults. They are married. I believe the Bible. So guess what? I believe that when my son took on his wife, he runs his house. Let me tell you how that works in the heir's house. See, things are serious in the heir's house. I remember the first time Blake and Rachel invited 
and Elizabeth and I over to dinner. Now, he was trying to figure out how the seating was going to sit because in my house, I sit at the head of the table. And there's a reason for that. That's where I'm supposed to sit. I also have a chair in my house that's off limits to everybody else because that's where I sit. Now, that's because I'm old school. Now, I know some of you liberated women are going, a chair does not have gender. Yes, it does. That's called the daddy chair. Now, as you get older, the daddy chair means more and more to you. See what I'm saying? So Blake was trying to figure out, and I looked, and I said, Blake, this is your house, son. You sit at the head of this house. When I come into this house, I listen to what you say. I said, however, I will remind you, when you step back into my house, that's my house. <laughs> and so I'll take your suggestions, but not they are purely suggestions. Right, Charlie? Charlie, I bet you sit at the head of your house. I bet you got your own chair, too. And I bet when people mess with your chair, it bothers you. I found out years later that my children had played in my chair when I went away. I wasn't there. And who allowed that to happen? <laughs> See, that's why you got to have a father in the house. So our first job is to bless. Now, check this out. We project God. What's God's first thing? To? He blesses us. He created us in Genesis, and he didn't look at us and go, man, I've created a disaster. He looked at all that was created and said, it's good. It's worth blessing. And he put us naked in a garden. He said, y'all have a big time in the garden. He said, do anything you want in the garden except eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. And why did sin enter into the world? Because Adam stepped out of his position. Now, I know it's mess with y'all. Eve was created to fit Adam. And Adam was to project authority on the garden. And guess why Eve was talking to that, that snake? Because Adam was on the back nine playing golf. Adam wasn't paying attention to what he was supposed to be. And guess what? Not only was he not paying attention, he wasn't stepping in and taking hold of the blessing. You know what he should have done? That snake started talking to his wife. He should have said, hey, hey, listen, to chop your head off. Shut up. Don't be talking to my wife. Amen. Don't be talking to my wife. Man, when you see snakes talking to your wife, chop their head off. Now, not literally because they'll throw you in jail, but take care of the situation. Don't talk to my wife like that. What if, what if, oh, what if, ow, what if old Adam has said to old snake, don't be talking to my wife like that? Guess what Adam could have done? He could have said, snake, you shut up and never talk again. And guess what? That snake would have never talked again. In fact, Bill Maher, he likes to make fun of that. He says, well, Christians believe in talking snakes. I'd love to be on his show. Because if he says, so do you believe in a talking snake? I said, I'm talking to one right now. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know what snakes are? They are those who oppose the blessing of God. Snakes oppose the order of God. Snakes oppose the principles of God. Fathers, stay away from snakes. They're nasty. They crawl around in dark places, and they bite you. So how in the world is the Father supposed to stand in the blessing? we got to constantly be in prayer with God. Start there. I'm a blessing because I ask God to bless it through me. Check what he says here. Go with me to Luke <coughs> chapter 11, verse 9. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. You know why it will be given to you? Because it's already in you. Isn't that cool, Father Woosley? Father of many women. Three important girls in your life the only three important women in your life and one is more important than the other two that's your wife you got that don't you because <laughs> guess what she's staying and they're leaving yep. now right now you can't imagine you wanting them to leave they're not 12 yet Starting at 12, you will be praying with great fervor that God send them a husband. 
That's what your wife's father did. And look how God answered that. I've been praying for Drew long before I knew Drew. When Clacy turned to, I asked God if you could do a wedding at 12. <laughs> he said, no. Bless them. Guess what he says? Ask, and what happens? It will be given to you. And here's why. It's already in you. Fathers, ask for wisdom. God's put wisdom in you. Bring out that wisdom. Bring out that blessing. Bring out that certainty. Bring out the best for your children. Let me give you a heads up. Fathers, you should not want your children to be like you. Say amen. Please say amen. And quit doing this. You non-athletic fathers, quit looking on the fence and wondering why your child is not athletic. You would be the primary share of that DNA. Quit wanting your child to be what you want and start asking God who your child is. And whatever that is, is the best blessing ever. Yeah. So if you were an outside linebacker and God gives you a pianist, he did that for a reason. And by the way, you make more money in Nashville and your knees dirt a whole lot less. Let people be who God's made them to be. I really did that. I said, God, I do not, listen, this to me would be the grossest thing that could ever happen. My son be like me. And God did not make him like me. He's logical, reasonable, a lot of common sense, very conservative, a thorough thinker. I am D, none of the above. <laughs> but I wanted him to be who God made him to be. So I stand amazed at who God made him to be. You know why? I realized this from get-go one. Those aren't my children. Those are God's. I didn't make them. Now, I did a drive-by. <laughs> what about all us men? Some of y'all need to quit driving by. Let me tell you what needs to change. If you drive by, you need to stay with. Amen? Huh? Yeah. It's easy to make them. It takes a father to raise them. Amen. And it takes a God to project who God's made them to be. Isn't that great? Daddy, she's God's. She's God's gift to you. And now you make sure that God's gift gets in her, gets in him. Fathers, the most important thing you can make sure happens is that your children know the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when Clacy came out of the baptismal waters, I felt so so blessed as a father to know that both of my children knew the Lord Jesus Christ in a sincere and personal way, that their sins were forgiven and their destiny was heaven. Everything else from there was just in the bonus. And so many of us are so shallow on that and so committed to things that don't last. My son was an athlete, my daughter, a brilliant academic. Both of them are being blessed by what? God gave them. And he didn't give them the same thing. He gives us all something different. I thank God every day that they had a smart mother. Because when Clacy would bring me her homework, I was like, you need to go talk to your mother about that. You know why? I didn't know the answer. Third grade math. <laughs> she took calculus four. Why? See, God knew that I needed to listen. He said, you don't need no calculus. I said, you're right, Lord. I do not need any calculus. In fact, I told my algebra teacher, God rest her soul, free to Baker. I said, Ms. Baker, if you just let me get through this algebra, I promise I won't do anything that requires algebra in my life. And I don't. Preaching doesn't require algebra. <laughs> Other than this, God got me. Hebrew is a mathematical language. Imagine that. Check this out. And I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. First thing, fathers, you stand as the projection of blessing to your house. Bless your house. Love your wife with all intensity, and make sure your children know you're their daddy. And daddy's going to be there. How many of y'all understand? One of the, you got to be there. you got to be there. I remember one of the awfulest cussings I ever took. 
Somebody called me and they said, Pastor, can you meet with me? And I said, no. I got an appointment. My appointment was my son's ball game. They happened to be at the ball game. And they said, you said you had an appointment. I said, I do. It's my son's ball game. And she said, so do you think your son's ball game is more important than my problems? I went, absolutely. <laughs> That's my son. He ain't screwed up yet. You a mess. <laughs> and me meeting with you an hour ain't going to correct anything. <laughs> me missing his ball game, though, may cause a lot of problems. Got set priorities. I'm glad I didn't miss his ball games. I'm glad I was there. Clacy, I can't believe I'm saying this. I must be fully under an anointing of the Holy Spirit that I have never been under. I was glad I was at dance recitals. <laughs> Took me six years to realize the same recital went on Sunday afternoon. It's Saturday afternoon. And then another six years, I said, this is kind of telling a story, isn't it, Clacy? She goes, yeah, Dad, it's called a ballet. <laughs> you know, I just never, I mean, ballets are cool. I've been to them. But I never in my life just woke up one morning and said, man, I can't wait to go to the ballet. I'm just not that guy. <laughs> but you know what? Clacy exposed her father to culture. Now, one of my favorite recitals of hers was her senior recital. And I was grinning ear to ear, and I said, Clacy, this is the favorite of all recitals that I've ever been to. She goes, yeah, I know, Dad, because this is your last one. <laughs> she said, what if you have a granddaughter? I said, send me the video. <laughs> I'll pray for her father, Drew. Welcome to dance recital. It doesn't matter what's happening, fathers, but it matters what you're projecting. I didn't understand dance. For years, I asked Elizabeth. She hasn't told me to this day. Clacy started out four years old, and this is what they do. I said, how much are we paying for? She said, you don't want to know. I said, you're right. I don't want to know. So I thought, I could teach her that at home. Free. So fathers, guess what? Be there. Be a blessing for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be open. Now these are guarantees. You ask God to be a father of wisdom, you'll be a father of wisdom. You ask God to be a blessing, you'll be a blessing. But you've got to step into what God tells you. And that means this. You don't get to do what you want to do anymore when you become a father. You do what's best. You do what's greater for that child. When I became a father, guess what? I've, you all have heard me say this before. Sometimes you need to get out of the sand trap and back into the sandbox. But if you stay in the sandbox, eventually you'll be back in the sand trap. I was always in the sandbox with Blake, wherever he was. We grew up tight together. I got to go play golf at vacation. Well, I don't play golf. I got to go with Drew and Blake to the golf course. At the end of 18 holes, my son goes, Well, Dad, one thing's for sure. We can say that the accident has not affected your golf game whatsoever. <laughs> he said, It's as bad as it was before the accident. <laughs> yeah, that's really not my kind of game. You know why? Yeah. It requires patience, strategy. And it doesn't make a lick of sense. It ought to be the harder you smack the ball, the farther it goes. But that's not the case. That's why I like football. You hit the guy harder than he hits you, you win. Simple understanding. Golf, you hit the ball as hard as you want to, and it goes the wrong direction and hits somebody else. Yeah, bad game for people like me. But Blake and Drew like it because they like to think. On vacation, I just like to be. So guess what? Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. So stay in it. Father, stay with it. And guess what? I'm going to tell you what you need to do, daddies. You need to make sure you're praying with your wife and praying over your children. Clacy's here. She laughs. She said, Dad, I hated it when you disciplined me. I said, good. That was part of the experience. I didn't want you to enjoy it. 
And Clay said, I'd have to wear her out every once in a while. Somewhere she had a spirit of rebellion. I think it came from Rockfield. No, it really didn't. It came from her father. So she was just like me, and, I, and I'd have to discipline her. She said, what she hated at the end, we would pray. I added that twist to it. You bust them and pray over them, and they'll come out all right. I can tell you that now. But sometimes I had to put a little additive to the prayer to get their attention pointed toward God. Once we were pointing, I said, Clancy, I'm your father, and I will give you what blesses you even if you don't like it. Fathers don't ask what their children like. Fathers know what's best for their children and proceed. I heard this more than once. <coughs> Daddy, well, I don't like you. I don't like you either. But this is what we're going to do. Well, everybody else is doing it. I, how many of y'all heard that? I don't care what everybody else does. You're not everybody else. Any of y'all heard that? How many of y'all heard that from your daddy? Well, give praise to God you had a real father. The worst thing a father could do is want you to be like everybody else. I want you to be everything God made you to be. I want you to be what God assigned you to be. I want you to be full of his grace and his love and his joy and his peace and God. And not everybody else wants that, but I want that for you. How many of you have noticed that men aren't quite as emotional as women? Any of y'all notice that? I'm just making an observation. Have you noticed that yet? You better get to notice it real fast. It'll cause you a lot less trouble when you realize it. Al, are you like just a, a bastion of emotion? No, me either. I mean, I'm just not that emotional. Now, guess what? God made us that way. Klein, what about you? Have you ever looked at your boys and said, Garrett, how do you feel today? You ever said that? Garrett, you ever heard that from your father? Good, you had a real father. Not one time I've lived over half a century has my father to this day ever asked me how I feel. You know why? He could care less. <laughs> He's not there about my feelings. He's there about my projection, and he wants the best for me. And I'm going to preach for just a minute. We need to get out of the feeling business. We've run this experiment for 60 years. It failed miserably, and we need to get back to the truth experience. Amen? And here's the difference. Here's the problem with feelings. I can feel stuff that's absolutely wrong. But the truth puts in motion what is right. So my dad doesn't ask me what I feel. He asks me crazy things like, what has God said? Ew. I don't hear what God said. I'd rather talk about how I feel. And guess what? If Adam had been paying attention, the garden would still be in motion. Yeah. What did the snake ask Eve about? Her feelings. Well, doesn't that look good? That's a feeling. The sign said, don't eat it. Well, how's it look? Who cares how it looks? It don't matter how it looks. You can't eat it, don't look at it. That's right. That applies to some other things, too. That's right. If that ain't your wife, don't look at her. Don't be going, what if? I tell you what if, broke. That'll take care of the me too. <laughs> Start looking over there, you'll be me too, too, okay? Because guess what? God's into what's right and not what's will bite you. Look at what he said. What one of you fathers would do this? What father among you, if his son asked for a fish, instead would give him a snake? Who would do that? Answer that for me, church. What kind of father? Would, as a father, would, if your child said, I need some fish, how many of y'all would, would give him a snake? Because we don't hanker for snake unless you're from Texas. How many of y'all have ever said, man, I just like to have a mess of rattlesnakes right now? <laughs> if I could just have some re fresh rattlesnake fried up, I'd feel so good. You've never said that, but you've said this. Man, if I could have some Long John Silvers. If I could have some Captain D's. <laughs> Elizabeth and I understand those aren't real fish, but that's the way Jesus fixes them. Because <laughs> remember, he dies and rises again, okay? So he ain't worried about no Long John Silvers. No, no, have some fish. If I'm going to give you some food, have, 
Because I hate snakes. How many of y'all hate snakes? I thought about the snakes, and I got to tell y'all, it's a crazy story. I sacrificed my daughter one time for a snake. That's how scared of them I am. I'm telling you, listen, I see a snake, I turn into a seventh grade girl. Ain't no doubt about it. I mean, instantly. Ah! But we're out at the lake, and we're in this cove, and, and Elizabeth sees a snake. And back when Blake was a child, he wasn't as calm, cool, and collected as he is today. So then he sees the snake. Well, Clacy's almost on the ladder on the back of the boat. And she looks at Blake and goes, don't say anything. Because she knew what my reaction was going to be. So Blake, following his mother's obedience to her command, he goes, snake! <laughs> well, I mean, I thought he was on my back. I, I didn't know where it was. I just heard him yell snake, and he's a little old cotton top guy, hair standing up on his head. He's in his life jacket. His face is red, and I'm thinking, I'm seeing in my mind the snake has his mouth wide open getting ready to go for the juggler. <laughs> Would have saved my life because I knew that snake was coming after me the way he yelled. In two leaps, on the second one, I grabbed Clacy on the ladder, and I just flip her back in the water because <laughs> I knew she was so mean, ain't no snake going to eat her. <laughs> And I got up in the back of the boat, and Elizabeth looked, you just flipped Clacy out in the water. I said, I'm going to go get her. And then I went, no, you go get her. I'll watch out for both of you. That's a true story. You know why? What kind of father would do that? One that is terrified of snakes. No, I mean, watch this. We don't want our children to have snakes. We want them to have what's right. But hold on, I'm give you some things that are snakes. I'll give you one word, fathers. You've got to say it, and you've got to hold to it. What do you think is one of the great words that would change our generation? No. No. Guess what I've had to say before as a father? No. Now, let me give you a secret. That's why I got my chair. You know why I figured it out? You go see the judge. You ever seen a judge sitting on a stool? Mm. Y'all ever seen a judge in a little old skinny chair? Mm. He got a judge chair. That's the chair in my living room. It's where you come see me. Daddy, can I go? No. Now, immediately, it's like politics. As soon as I say no, guess where they go? Pellet court. Mom. How many of y'all have ever had this happen? You say no. And they come back with another, usually mom. And she goes, well, don't you think? And, I'm, and I've, here's the way you do it as a father. You got one eyeball on that child, and you got that other eyeball on your wife. Like, I'm telling you what, she's going to clear this house. I mean, me and you going to have a talk coming back in here. <laughs> and then usually what happens, you go through that process, you say no again. Then the child leaves, and the wife wanders back in. Because the child has consulted with, and I, they don't think my little ears could pick up all the things they were saying. But they've learned I've heard a lot more than they thought I did. And I'd hear them in the kitchen strategizing. And I'd hear Clacy going, Mom, you're the only person in the world to make him do stuff. Tell him this is going to be all right. And here come Mom. Honey, I think it'll be all right. I said, all right, if something happens to him, I'm writing off right here. I was like Pontius Pilate. I am washing my hands of this situation. And if it goes south, it's on you. I'm going to tell God, my wife did it. <laughs> but guess what? Sometimes I still have to say, guess what? No. And I love it when it turns out right. Because I remind them of that constantly. <laughs> Remember that time y'all asked me if you'd have win? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So guess what? Fathers, say no when you got to say no. And they're going to kick a fit. And they're going to tell you they don't like you. And they're going to tell you it's the worst thing that's ever happened in their life. They're going to tell you they're never going to be surviving. But guess what? I finally figured out my dad. And it took me forever. My father, I got a great father. Still got a great father. He's still living. Beautiful man. He used to make me mad in a hornet, though. The dude can stay calm no matter what. And I get, a little, I get a little crazy about things. You know, somebody, I mean, we'd always kid my, my dad. I mean, at the end of time, meteors be knocking houses down and stuff. You know, balls of fire, hailstones and stuff. He'd walk out in the front yard with his suit coat button and go like this. Well, the Bible said this day would come. And here it is. 
yeah, his father passed away, and we're driving back from Nashville, and so I look at my dad, and I said, Dad, are you, I mean, I ask him this question, are you feeling all right? He goes, yes, I feel fine. Dad's passed away, I'm next, and you'll be after that. <laughs> and those of y'all that know my father, he's that matter of fact. But guess what he told me? Gene, guess what he told me? The truth. He was saying, son, life is short. Live out what you're supposed to as you're living. Do it now. Don't put it off to yesterday. Live out. But I finally figured out my father. Now, I had to die to figure out my father almost. He doesn't focus on temporary events. He stays focused on eternal reality. Because he's always told me, this place doesn't last for long. Look forward into where you're heading. Father, it's the greatest thing you can give your children is the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because when they do, you have positioned them in an eternal reality that will bless them forever and ever and ever. Amen. Greatest gift is the grace of Jesus Christ. It is greater than all these other little things we get involved in because guess what? You're not always going to be an athlete. I don't care what you do. You're not always going to be one of those. But you're always going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What father among you, if the child asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father, you ready for this? Give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask. You know what that means is? Anybody in here today that asks will have. Now, I have some of my theological friends, they disagree with me, and they're wrong. It's okay to be wrong. And one day they'll read the Bible fully, and they'll realize that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all people, Amen. not some people. Amen. And guess what? All the people that will be in hell, they'll be there for one reason. They didn't ask. That's right. They didn't ask. They didn't say, Father who art in heaven, I'm a sinner, and I need you to forgive me. Would you forgive me? Because I know you died for me, and I know you've risen for me, and now I need to receive your forgiveness. And guess what? If you ask God for forgiveness, he's sure not going to give you a snake, and he's sure not going to send you a scorpion. You know why? Because God doesn't give us things that bite and sting. What do snakes do? Bite. <laughs> I'm not going to tell that story because <clears throat> it was told enough in the presidential campaign. President Donald John Trump, he thought that was a new story. He, about the little snake, you know, you pick up the snake and you know what it was when I picked you up. He really was fascinated with that story. If he'd gone to church, he'd realize that that was an old evangelist story from about 50 years ago. But if you play with snakes, they'll bite you. And if you hang around scorpions, they'll sting you, even if they feel good for the moment. So, Father, keep your children away from the snakes, and don't let them be around things that will sting them. Say no when you need to say no, but guess what? Say yes a lot more than you say no. Yes, you can. Yes, you will. Yes, God is. Those are the things of a father that knows how to bless. Amen? Happy Father's Day. Did you, did you dads get anything today? All right, let me sum it up. I'm going to break it down for men. You ready? Bless, love, give, encourage. You got it? Wives, can you all hold them? Get, you, look, it'd, be, it'd be, be a great way to handle your husband. In telling and asking him how he feels, because y'all throw us for a loop when y'all do that. Y'all really do. I just want to let y'all know. Like when my wife goes, how do you feel about that? Let me show you what I'm doing inside. Uh, 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 uh. Amy, mean, you ever known that when you ask girls what, what he feels? I mean, his head just has a mental meltdown, doesn't it? Kim, what about Mr. Rogers feeling over here? What about when you ask Jeff what he feels? You might as well ask that chair. Now, what if you reverse that and you said, what does God say? That's right. Oh, by the way, you see, then you're going to need 
to really listen to Pastor Jeff Crabtree and get in Bible study because, men, if you know what God says, then you know how to put that blessing on what God says on your house. But if you don't know what God says, how do you know how to put that blessing on God's house? Now it makes sense. Amen? Yeah. Plus, you've got a great husband. Part of the reason for that is her mother and I prayed. I mean, we prayed. I mean, like sackcloth and ashes type prayer on the ground. God, send him. Drew, guess what I pray now? Lord, help him hang on. May he never let go. <laughs> and I pray that selfishly. Don't let her come back here, Lord. Don't let her come back. <laughs> no, I just kid Clacy all the time. Guess what? You want your children to become adults. I want my son to be a blesser. I want my daughter to be an encourager of the blesser. And I want their children to be blessed. So, Pastor Wayne, when I look at those three kids, you and I kind of grin. I remember those days, you know, y'all are packing them up, putting them up, and hoping they'll shut up at times. That's just part of life. But I have no idea who those babies will be. Well, I was watching Duke crawl across the floor on one of those Instagram, Snapchat, or Snaps, whatever that thing is. Elizabeth shows me all this stuff. And I said, I wonder if that's the next president of the United States crawling across the floor. And would we have the privilege of Hillview of influencing their young days? Huh. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Ross, did, uh, uh, did you ever think you'd be eating dinner with the president of the university with your pastor when you were in the sixth grade? I didn't either. But guess what? There you were. I'm like, man, I'm so proud of this young man. He's not a boy anymore. He's a young man. Well, yeah, did you ever think you'd watch your son smoothly lead worship with the power of the Holy Spirit like he does? Especially when he's about three and y'all were wondering, what is God going to do with this kid? But you were a blesser. You know why you were a blesser? Because your daddy was a blesser. Now let me tell you something. Fathers, you decide this day to be a blesser. And you don't worry about what happened from fathers of the past. You say, today, I am putting a stake in the ground, and I will be a father that blesses my family. I will change the course of history in my family line by the power of Jesus Christ. It'll happen. So let's stand together. You have not because you ask. Not. And you have because you ask. You know why I'm saved? I asked Jesus to save me. He said, certainly. And I said, well, Lord, I don't deserve it. He said, that's true. That's why we call it what, Han Shell? Grace. If me and you had to carry our worn central resumes up there to heaven, whoo, Lord have mercy. We'd be in deep nine hell if we had to go on them resumes. You know it? You ready? Some of y'all need to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life today. You need to do that. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me. The greatest thing you could do for your family today is become a father that is saved. Then you can look at your children and say, I want you to be what God wants you to be. I, I, I want to show you everything God's teaching me. You say, Pastor Steve, you don't understand. My children are grown. Well, then show them that a grown man can receive Jesus. Man up. If you haven't been baptized, men, you get in this baptistry and you show your family that your sins are buried and your new life is risen, especially because we tend to check out first. And I don't want your wife wondering if you were saved. I want to know, hey, my husband was fully obedient. Here's his baptismal picture. We got to do a lot of funerals at Hillview now. Mark, it's interesting. Guess what? One picture is always in that deal baptismal picture they'll always say pastor steve you remember this i said i sure do last week we had a guy 52 years old died had stroke died you know why that happens it happens to humans it happens to anybody anybody at any time he got baptized seven years ago guess what picture his wife was holding on to because when you die you want to go where jesus is amen <laughs> 
And so Jamie was holding on to that picture of that baptism. That's how important it is. And so uh, I guess 11 o'clock we'll, we'll have seen 10,000 baptisms, right? Maybe. I think so. I believe so. You're hoping so. We got one back there. We got one back there. So that's 9,999, right? Yeah. We might baptize Elizabeth again. She probably needs it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord. You bring us to the altar today. We pray for our children that are going to be saved this week. We pray for Mission X as it goes. We pray for the fathers today, Lord, that have, have, have stepped up and been blessers and projectors of grace in their family. Now bring them and let them just be touched by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Church, this altar is open for anybody and everybody to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and to be saved for all eternity. Come and be one of the miracles. Bring somebody down here with you as a part of that miracle. But let's pray. Let's love. And let's let God have his way. Let's let God have his way. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and tell. That you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Thank you guys. You guys have a great Father's Day. You're dismissed.